If I can have your attention, please. If I can have your attention, please. It's going to work much better tonight. It's going to work much better tonight. You need a microphone. I'm going to do my best once everybody else in your room quiets down. Okay? Guys! The only way this is going to work is if we all listen to what each other have to say. So, my name is Glenn Shoulder. I'm here tonight to work with the Planning Commission in preparing an update to the Plan of Conservation and Development. This is Karen Levitt-Smith, who is the Chair of the Commission. We have some welcoming words. I, I want to welcome everybody, and I am so pleased with this turnout. So when we did this six or seven years ago, um, we didn't have this room filled. So thank you for all taking time out of your busy schedules, caring about our town and, and how we move forward um, and helping us on the Planning Commission. I do want to acknowledge my fellow commissioners, Bill Rice, um, Julie Eaton, Craig McCormick, uh, Diane Duran, Joe Campolietta, Holly Bem. Did I miss anybody? I think I got everybody. Um, and I know that we have our first selectman, Wendy McStudis, here, <coughs> and um, other people from the um, Board of Selectmen, Eric Wellman, um, Amber Buell. Did I miss anybody? I, if I did, I'm like skinning the room. Heather oh, Heather, see, I knew I was going to forget somebody, no Heather Getz. So I just want to uh, thank them, and I know our chair of zoning, uh, Dave Ryan, is here as well. So again, thank you for all being here. I'm really excited to hear everyone's feedback as we really start this process to help the Planning Commission revise our uh, POCD. So, um, and I can't say enough good things about Glenn, who's shepherding this. And a big shout out to um, our planner, George McGregor, who really got everything together and is running smoothly um, because of him and his staff. So a big thank you to George. So welcome and um, thank you again. So as I indicated earlier, my name is Glenn Chalder. I've actually been a Simsbury resident off and on for 50 years. So that's <laughs> hard to believe when I think about it. But I'm probably here for the very same reasons that you guys are here in terms of what Simsbury means to you. So I am a planning consultant. I work with towns on land use planning, and we're here tonight doing something which is very important for towns, which is we're thinking about things for the future and preparing what's called in Connecticut a plan of conservation and development. And really, this is a strategic view of where we're going as a community. We can't hear you. So do me a favor, move up. The microphone, unfortunately, is on that wall. Why don't you use one of these? They can't. These are for, this is for the video. I'm going to do my best. Okay. So tonight's program is going to cover a couple of basic steps. The first step is what is a plan of conservation and development? I'd like to explain that to you. Um, you all participated in some exercises when you got into the room. Thank you very much for that. And we're going to be able to learn some things, so we're going to talk about those exercises. We're going to have an open discussion about different topics and ideas that were identified by people in the room as being important to you. And then our basic rule of thumb is a hard adjourn at 9 o'clock. So we have a time constraint, and we're going to try to move purposefully um, through the various parts of the meeting. Your first question might be, what is the plan of conservation and development? The state statutes require that every municipality in the state prepare a plan of conservation and development. But basically, it's an advisory document that's intended to guide a community into the future. So if we don't have a sense of where we're going, we're unlikely to get to where we want to be. So a plan is an opportunity to stop, take stock of where we're going, and make strategies for the future. And really, to answer the question, what, what kind of community do we want Simsbury to be in the future? So why might a community prepare a plan of conservation and development? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all is to, to try to figure out where we are as a community, what's going on. Um, as Aaron indicated, this is an update of a plan that was prepared in 2017. That's only five years ago. But think about how much has changed in the past five years. We had a, a global pandemic. What's happened with retail and office occupancy as a result of that has changed dramatically. And so the Planning Commission in the town decided to undertake this process to get a grip on things that are affecting us today and likely to affect us in the future. So understanding where we are is an important part of the process. 
The other thing we're going to be looking at is where are we heading? So what's Einstein's famous saying for the definition of insanity? Anybody know? Repeating it and not getting different Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So we're going to take a look at what's going to happen if we keep doing the things that we're doing and decide if we think those are positive outcomes for our community. Or in fact, are there other places or things that we want to try to accomplish? And that's actually where your input tonight is going to be so useful and helpful to us. Because once we understand where it is that we want to go, we're going to start doing the things that are going to get us there and stop doing the things that don't. And if we didn't do a plan, we might not know what those things are. And if we don't write it down, we may not always remember. So that's the value of a plan, and that's why we plan and what we're working on. So some of the takeaways that I'd like for you to um, think about for tonight, the plan is not a dictatorial document. Every board and committee commission in the town has independent authority to make their own decisions and do what statutes require them to do. So it's hard for one board to tell another board, you have to do this. So the plan has to be team building, it has to be collaborative, and it's got to be advisory. But its strength comes because you're all here tonight participating and telling us what's important, and that's going to give us positive direction for the future. The second part is the plan is supposed to be strategic and visionary long term. It doesn't say to you know, each week fill out your time report. It doesn't get to that level of detail. But what it does do is look at the big picture, longer term strategies for the community, and that's what it uh, attempts to lay out. The third thing is it's mostly concerned with the physical development of the community. So we're really interested in land uses in our town, the zoning where things are located, how we can guide the development to make our community a stronger place, but it doesn't generally get involved in the snow plowing routes or the other things like that. It's important that those are taken care of but again, we're mostly concerned with the physical development, and we do also care about economic and social development. And I think the overall goal of the plan, perhaps like yourselves, is to make Simsbury an even better place in the future. So there's a couple of common components to plans, and Simsbury's plan is no different. It's called a plan of conservation and development, so it has this conservation element about things we want to protect in our community, the things that resonate with each of you and so when we ask things in the community that you're proud of you probably expressed some of those to us and we'll talk about that in a minute there's a development element change is going to happen in our community much as it did over the past five years and even the decades before that but how do we want to guide this change in the future and make Simsbury a better place and then the last major element is what services and facilities we want to provide in our community. Schools, where we are today, um, town hall, recreation facilities, etc. And all of those come together to really sort of make up a POCD. So some of the strategies um, and the common components, um, sustainability may become a new theme in the plan because sustainability is growing. Um, and it becoming an important issue for communities. The conservation elements of the plan typically include things like natural resources, open space, historic resources, agriculture, community character, community spirit, the things that help tire the fabric of our community together. The development element of the plan looks at things like Simsbury Center, the different villages that Simsbury has, Terrafield, Weetog, West Simsbury, etc. The northern part of Simsbury. Uh, looks at business and economic development, housing affordability and housing needs, um, and other development type issues. And then what we call the infrastructure or services and facilities element deals with community town facilities and services. Are we providing what the residents want? Vehicular transportation, pedestrian, bicycle, transit, these types of things and then also utility availability. So those are the elements of the plan, and I think you probably noticed that in the planning points exercise, these were uh, represented there. And it's finding that sweet spot in the middle between each of these three elements. In my work, I have a chance to work in many towns around the state, and honestly, every community is different in some material way. They don't all aspire for the same things. 
So again, your being here tonight uh, helps us do this for Simsbury. So what I'd like to do next, if we can, is talk a little bit about the exercises that people had a chance to participate in. Um, I put the maps up here. The first exercise is we ask people to tell us where they live. I realize that the blue dots may be a little faded. Can anybody discern any pattern from the blue dot? First of all, can you see the blue dots on the map? <laughs> <Nope. Sorry. laughs> Well, then I guess there's no pattern, huh? Yeah. But actually, that's probably a fair statement, too, because I've looked at this map, and it seems to me that the blue dots are coming from all parts of the community, all different areas. So we don't have neighborhoods here today that are excited or concerned about a particular issue, but we're likely to get input from people from all parts of the community. And I think that's a good indication of things that are going to help serve us well in the preparation of a plan because hopefully we're going to get diverse thoughts and ideas as a result of that. Do you think that's a fair conclusion from this map? Now it starts to get really interesting. <laughs> so the next exercise, I know you can see the green dots. Yeah. So we ask people as part of uh, the exercises here, um, is to identify things that they're proud of in the community. And the, w the reason that we use the word proud is that we didn't ask you what you like in the community or you know, where you habituate or, or other things like this. The word proud actually touches people in an emotional way. These are places that if you had guests or visitors coming to town, places that you might want to take people. And so there's useful information in this map um, and because, hopefully, you will fill out your cards, and if you haven't turned them in already, please do so before you leave here tonight, because we're going to compile all that information. But what do you think are some of the patterns on the map for Prouds? Downtown. Downtown. Okay. So, the, you said downtown. I'm going to write Simsbury Center here, okay? Good. Other things? Farm. Barns? No, farmers. Farms. 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 Performing Arts Center. Yeah. Library. Thank you. <laughs> Flower Bridge. There you go. Good for you. Bike Rail Trail. Yep. Yeah. The River. Beautiful. We know what's going on over here? Cool. Simsbury Farms. Simsbury Farms. Yeah. Well, that's what farms are going to Oh, when you said farms, that was that, Yeah, but you can keep Oh, you guys are sneaky. You guys are really sneaky. Okay. Anything else there that jumps off that map at you? Do all Walker Woods down there? Uh, it's probably open space, so I'm going to write open space. I think there's a number of places around that looks like they're open space. Somebody said something I didn't write down. It was I did schools. Schools, thank you very much. So talk about this in a little bit. Let's talk about saris. <laughs> so you notice that the distribution is very different than it was for crowds, correct? Yes. So what do you think is going on here? So I heard apartments. What else? Traffic. What's the first one? Uh, apartments. Hey, I'm sorry. If you guys try to read my writing, it's not going to go well. I can read it, which is good, but it's kind of a shorthand. So I got apartments and traffic here. The Wagner building. Okay. Other things? The old Hartford property. Mm. Yeah, or loss of the Hartford. Well, mm. yeah, loss of it, but oh, the, it, it just the look of it. Mm. Okay, anything else? Lighted properties. What? 
related properties like Wagner and Yep. Yeah. Good. Anything else? So I think we had the highlights on center development. Center development. Yeah. So I'm not sure what you what you meant by that. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about why we've run these exercises um, because I think it's important for you to realize that we weren't engaging you in exercises for the fun of it. We actually are going to learn quite a bit from this exercise. In our, our experience over the years, the prouds are things that people like about Simsbury and might want to encourage in the future. So when we talk about things that ended up sort of on this list, community facilities or park and recreation facilities or the Flower Bridge or the Performing Arts Center, these are things that kind of resonate with people in Simsbury about their community. And so those might be things we, we might want to encourage in the future, things that contribute to our character what we perceive as the character of the community or quality of life in the community. These are things that tend to make people proud um, and um, things that make people feel good about their community. So if we can accentuate things to do that, we can make our community a better place and um, places that uh, people are more likely to be proud of. And the counteract to that is sorries. Well, saris are kind of interesting. Prouds often are big picture things, but saris are very often smaller things. They tend to be things that are people feel threatened or detract from the community. They erode the quality of life or they're irritants. For example, number four on the list, Wagner Ford, right? I mean, Wagner Ford was a going business in town for, for an awfully long time. And then the world has changed a little bit. Unfortunately, the building sits there um, and may continue to for some time. So these are things that you know, can affect the community in negative ways. So in the future, if we identify what these are, we can be aware of it and try to manage those better. So George is here at an opportune time. Oh, turn that around. Oh, hide that, George. Right away. There you go. So the other exercise we asked people to participate in was this exercise called Planning Points. And why this is important and useful here is that unbeknownst to you, or maybe you figured it out, we put you on, on the horns of a conundrum, which is there were 12 boxes, and you only had five bills. So you had to decide where to put those. And the second thing was the, the point values were different. So for very often, people look at their 20-point bill and look at the boxes and say, where am I going to put this? And it's an opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, to make choices about the community. You could put all 50 points in one box or you could spread them out. I've seen people actually rip bills in half. <laughs> I've seen people take five and write 20 on it like it's a different color and I wouldn't figure it out. But again, it's, it's meaningful for you. But what's important to you is actually when you put it all together, important to everybody in the community. There's this book that was written probably 15 years ago or so. It's called The Wisdom of Crowds. And the basic idea is that when all of us get together and try to tackle the same question or problem, we're smarter than any one of us individually. Each of us has our own particular issues that we're concerned about. And so not everybody's going to share that perspective. But when you put all the points together and treat them as a reflection of the community, it starts to. And that's where the planning points comes in. So what we're going to do here tonight is have a conversation from between now and 9 o'clock to talk about the issues that got the most planning points in the community. We're going to try to get to as many as we can between now and 9 o'clock um, and see what happens. So just from an overall perspective, what do you think got the most planning points on our list? Everybody's afraid to answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Open no. space. Very good. Open space was the number one issue. 565 points. What do you think was second on the list? 
sustainability. Business and Economic Development 535, number three. Sustainability. Sustainability at 385, and then number four is Housing Affordability Needs at 365. So, Housing Affordability and Needs at 365. So I'm gonna put the list here. Uh, it's probably gonna be hard to read from the back of the room. Let me just kind of give you an overview of what we think is going to happen from here on out. Bear with me for a moment. So, we're going to talk about um, current issues in the community. Why did you put your planning points in this? Why do you think it's important for us? Um, we're going to try to give an overview of the topic and then move on. Um, we're going to try to get to as many topics as we can. So there's going to come a point in time on a topic. I'm going to have to truncate the discussion so we can get on to the next one. So the most important thing is if all of us can be try to be concise in our wording in terms of what we want to say, that'll allow us to get to as many topics uh, as we can. Uh, and again, our, our basic rule of thumb is 9 o'clock. You guys have been great. We've got an hour and 20 minutes. It's probably enough time to get through quite a bit of stuff. So let's start off here. Why did you put your planning points in this box? And why do you think this is important to Simsbury? And the number one topic that's up is open space. Who wants to start? Of course, we could be done shorter than nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> open space defines the important part of this town. Open space is the most important part of this town. So when you say the important part, can you be more precise? Uh, we have certain parts of town, uh, all throughout the town, that have open space. You have Neville Walker Woods. You now have a Meadowwood property. Uh, you, and I consider Simsbury Farms part of that as well. Uh, the reason people move here, schools, open space, recreation. Okay. And safety. And safety. Okay. Well, historically, Simsbury has been a pretty agricultural town. So having the open fields is sort of, it feels familiar in the scene. <coughs> Keeps the, yeah, it's. Good, well, excellent. It's gone, it's gone for good. That's a good point, it's scarce. So the issue that we sometimes get to in a plan of conservation and development is what, what do we mean by open space? So this is the thing we kind of grapple in the POCD with, because there's different definitions of open space. So some open space can be, I think somebody said Ethel Walker Woods. That's a piece of property which the town is very active in acquiring, and now we're going to say that it's preserved. The town owns it, they bought it for open space. We can probably be pretty sure that that land's not going in. There's other land in town which is owned by the land trust. Now they're not a town entity, but their mission is the preservation of land as open space, and so we can probably be pretty sure that that land's not going anywhere. But there can be other properties which are privately owned or owned by associations that may not be protected. And so we struggle sometimes about whether or not those should be open space. And then the other struggle is if we have large landowners in town who had 40 acres, okay? It's not protected. And it could be land that they could develop in the future, correct? It's zoned, etc. So it looks like open space because it, it's not developed, but it may not be. So I think our efforts as part of the POCD in the past have been to try to focus on those distinctions, celebrate what we have, recognize as the gentleman started off with, it's, it's important part of Simsbury's overall ambiance and, and character and how can we continue to enhance and maintain this legacy going forward? Any other meaningful thoughts on open space going forward? Well, I didn't vote for it as the priority since we've already done such a good job of preserving it for the last 30 years. Where the land trust has already preserved about a thousand acres. There, the farms, I have helped uh, appraise these farms so that they could get development rights. So they are protected in perpetuity. And so the job of planning would be to identify the privately owned large tracts 
Uh, and I don't think there are a great number of those. There are small ones, but so you would have to identify and illustrate what we already have that's protected forever. Yeah. Versus little pieces here and there that may or may not be valuable open space. So I think the issue here is part of our strategic vision for Simsbury. In the current plan, we celebrate in the plan the fact that Simsbury has been quite effective about preserving land on Talcott Mountain on the eastern side of town, plus land on the ridges on the western side of town. And we set the stage in our current in the plan five years ago to try to work towards connections between those two. So almost the letter H or multiple letters that you know, if we could get from one side of town through open space and bike trails and other stuff to the other side of town and Sindri farms and other stuff, how much that could enhance the open spaces we've got, really celebrate what we've got and move in that direction. So that's a, perhaps a good example on the, on the number one topic here of the things that the Planning Commission is trying to work for that we think could help make our community a better place. Celebrate what we've got and identify priorities and stuff for the future is part of a vision rather than sort of individual pieces just because. So we're not focusing on the, the number of acres at the bottom line as being the total. What we're really sort of looking at is sort of the bigger picture on that. So. Any other key issues on open space? Yes, sir. So part of open space, though, is that you have to provide the financing for stewardship. These are great properties, <laughs> but they need to be taken care of properly, and we need to have the manpower and the financing available to do that. A good point. We've done a great job. We've done a great job acquiring the land. Now we have to take care of it. Yep. And, and I think that's the uh, next step in a lot of open space preservation because the first focus in many communities, and since we got ahead of the game of a lot of communities in Connecticut in terms of focusing on open space, subdivisions were required to provide 20% of the land area for open space. So we were able to assemble a lot of open space but we didn't always create a system, and we may not always have the, had, had the tools in place to finance or manpower to steward that property going forward. And so that may be the next stage here. I also want to mention clean water, so protecting our land is critical for... I, yep, so I'm going to clean. ask you to hold off on that thought. Unfortunately, natural resources ended up number eight. We'll get to that oh, later. I didn't know that that That's was okay. That. No. Okay. All right, so I'm going to move on to topic number two, unless Bill. Yeah, Glenn, just uh, one, one comment. Uh, a recent inventory of protected spaces in town runs about 35% of, uh, of the land area. That's Does this group feel that that's sufficient? We should maintain that? Or should we strive to acquire more? All right, so it's almost a three-part question. I would ask that everybody only put your hand up once, okay? So the first part would be, who thinks that we have enough open space in Sims where we don't need any more? Okay, I'm gonna estimate that about 10 to 15% of the room. How many people feel that what we have, this is like the three bears, right? Who feels we have just the right amount? Wasn't that the same no, question? That's the same. That's, that was the same answer. <laughs> Watch. Just no. did that to see if you guys are paying attention. <laughs> Maybe there's only two questions then. All right. How many people feel that we should continue our efforts to preserve open space in the future and acquiring additional land for open space? All right, guys. So I'd have to say some people didn't vote, but that to me it looks like 25 to 35. So I'm getting some sense of more. All right. <laughs> Bill, it wasn't precise. Well, another option would be to reduce the amount of open space. No. I'm not going to ask that one, but you're a great man. There's time left at the end. I would like to have a section on that vote where we have the little spots that are isolated and not maintained or not naturalized or used, that they no longer be open space. And I know there's legislative difficulty about that, but they could be used for another purpose, which I'll mention later. 
So the gentleman raises an interesting point. The basic concept would be is perhaps over the years, Simsbury may have acquired smaller parcels of land that, you know, was land required to be preserved, but it may not serve a, a useful purpose for the preservation of water quality or natural resources. It's just there. Could it, all right, could it make sense for Simsbury to investigate maybe selling that land and putting the money into acquisition of new and, and more interesting open space. Is that something that you think that could or should be explored? Yes. Yes. Good? All right, Bill, I may save you a little bit on that one. Okay, so the next topic is business and economic development. So who put their points there? And why? I'm sorry? What was your question again, please? So the, question, the next topic was business and economic development. Thank you. Um, why did people put their points there? Why was this important? If you don't keep that up, then you can't afford to do any of the rest of it. Okay. Or right. we voted that way because we got a reassessment. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but it's very real. I mean, we, the property owners are carrying the town, and, and we need some business in town that's of greater size than what we've got. Amen. Yep. So I think it's important to state uh, just on this that a reassessment is a re recognition, if you will, of how much housing prices have escalated in the last couple of years. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean taxes are going to go up. I think we can all sense that they will over time, but generally when assessments go up, the tax rate goes down, right? right. So the, ta the town uses the assessment to figure out what is a balanced approach between all of us to share the expenses of the town. So uh, if, if businesses have suffered over the last 10 years and their assessments have gone down, then residences are probably going to be paying a little bit more as part of that. So. I got the same message in the mail today that perhaps others did, and yeah. the issue is, okay, that's the first message, and now we gotta wait and find out what the next message is. But, but the point is the balance between property owners and business. Yeah. Right. If you don't have a business base, the business base can't support the town. No. Yeah. Well. So, business and economic development covers a lot of different things overall. So, um, there are perhaps three reasons why towns might seek business and economic development. So there's some communities around the country where they think business and economic development is important for them because they would like jobs for their residents. So you can perhaps see that in some communities that have suffered because of employment issues and they want new business and economic de development for jobs. We're somewhat fortunate to be part of a metro region that employment is available in a number of places around us but it's still a consideration. <coughs> Number two issue can be goods and services. There are places in Montana that if you want to go to a grocery store, you got to drive an hour. And so goods and services are important, and we're somewhat fortunate too. We have a number of local supermarkets and other stores and other things like that. So many things that we might want for our daily life is generally available either in Simsbury or nearby, so that's beneficial as well. And the third major reason is the first point that the gentleman brought up, which is taxes, or um, tax revenue, if you will, to support goods and services in the community. There are some communities in Connecticut with almost no business development, and residents foot the entire tax bill. And there are situations in Simsbury, for example, when Hartford Insurance was here, they were a significant portion of our tax base and helped significantly. So I'm going to ask you the question on those three things, which one you feel is the most important for Simsbury going forward? Who would put their vote into, we need business and economic development for jobs? Okay. How many people feel we need business and economic development for goods and services? Okay. And then how many people think we need business and economic development for, for our tax base? Can we vote all three times? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. I asked for one, but I think I got a clear indication. I think they are all important, there's no question, but I think the number one ranking, if you will, in the room is probably uh, for tax dollars to help the community. 
So the economy has changed quite a bit in the last five years. Things that we just never really anticipated. You do scenario planning and think, well, if this happens, what? I don't think we ever anticipated the pandemic and sort of the impact. It probably accelerated a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. So what should our business and economic development strategy be for the future? What do you think are things that we should be focusing on? I don't have the answer, but I think what hurt us the last several years um, has created a lot of new opportunities. So I, I think what might have hurt Simsbury as being a significant employment base, which is accessibility largely, um, is no longer the same issue. So there might be an ability to attract some intellectual property kinds of businesses, you know, leverage the state's R&D tax credits, do all those kinds of things to bring those kinds of jobs to the we've got a We've got a strong base of well-educated, smart people. It'd be nice if they could have some work here, even though I wanted to take care of the taxes. Yeah. So Connecticut's struggling a little bit these days. I think we've heard in the past, General Electric moved. Now, Lego kind of broke my heart a little bit, but okay. Um, but some of the places are looking at lower cost opportunities or proximity to higher education, research institutions, and things like that. So it's harder for us, actually. Uh, I remember when I um, first started working in the area, that the mantra, in a sense, was, well, Hartford's the insurance capital of the world. It's, it's recession-proof. Everybody's always going to buy insurance. And here we are. The Atmos part of CVS, Travelers, <coughs> Hartford Insurance, et cetera, there have been some significant changes. So I think that what the gentleman talks about is looking for new opportunities that take advantage of the things that we can offer and try to find better ways to compete with some of the towns that are around us. Try to be as competitive as possible in this area. It's not likely, I think, that we're going to rezone more areas for businesses. The businesses we have are probably in the areas of the community that have served us well and are likely to continue to. But the question is, how can we use those effectively in the future? Uh, I know you haven't asked this yet, so I don't know if you're going to, but can I comment on what I would like to not see for businesses in sure. town? Is that it? Yep. So that's our economic development strategy, or just no CBD? <laughs> I understand. I, I, all right, so we're trying to be big picture and strategic. Okay. So. Other thoughts in terms of business? Yep. Stronger support for small businesses. So how could we do that? Not there. <laughs> well, if I had that answer, I would have implemented it eight years ago. No, it's funny because I think the comment from over on this side of the room was shot there, and I think that's that's so true. That you know, there are times that I find it's easy to select things on Amazon because I get a selection and bump it's there and it's here in a day or two. But realistically, I try to shop at local businesses in town because I think it's important for them to be here to you know support us, and so we can support them. So there are places around the country that have, have tried to work on different strategies for this, and this is hard. Ithaca, New York, created what they called Ithaca Box. And the whole idea was when you went in and spent $20, $15 in a store but gave them a 20, they'd give you five or six back in Ithaca dollars, and the only place you could spend those was in town. And it actually was an interesting strategy. It didn't last forever. But the basic concept is looking for ways to support local businesses. So I think that is an important consideration. Hey, yeah. Can you get somebody over here? Raise their hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I didn't kind of get my field of view there. Thank you. Well, I think part of the challenge with some of the businesses that we have in, in mind is, I mean, I don't know what our caps, how our caps can be from different businesses or what that breakup is, but businesses don't own their office buildings anymore. They rent those from landlords. So a business might move into town, but they're going to 
you know, occupy an existing office building, someone else is going to build it for them and they're going to lease it from them. And they're either going to pay for the lease of the taxes themselves or the landlord's paying for it. So the problem is a lot of the taxes you get generated in most other places where you work outside of Connecticut. It's really from the real estate, it's not from the business itself. That goes you know, at the state level. So that's kind of the conundrum depending on what you're looking at. Yeah, so I mean, I think real estate tax revenue is the key element that affects yes. Simsbury. So there are places around the country that there's a local component of sales tax. I think it's in California that um, motor v uh, car dealers are Everybody wants a car dealer because they get sales tax on all the cars that are sold. So every time one goes out the door at $40,000, it, it can add up in terms of the local component. So to figure all of that. Yes? I think it's important to keep um, incentives to keep existing businesses here and just as much as trying to attract new businesses. Because mom pop businesses make up the town. Just like what the person said in the middle there, if we're going to keep shopping small, that's what makes up this town. The diversity. It's great to attract new businesses, but if we keep losing the ones we have, we're not going to be attracting the new ones. No. Yep. And I think in some conversations, that I, the meetings I've been having with the Chamber of Commerce and others is part of preparing this plan, that came through loud and clear as sort of the first part of our strategy is to try to keep and support what we've got. So I think we, we kind of got that. Um, I, I think that we have a great opportunity because of our beauty, our existing open spaces, um, to attract, uh, now with remote working, um, to attract um, uh, firms with greater intellectual property that attracts uh, or, or usage that uh, attracts professionals. And it's uh, a two-edged win-win um, because you get of course, as the gentleman pointed out, that uh, they're going to be residing in buildings, and we have some um, buildings that are being underutilized. Um, very beautiful place that used to be a wonderful building near the river um, that would attract people to uh, work in these facilities, attract um, different types of, uh, of uh, businesses to be in these facilities that give us tax revenue, and at the same time, um, have a work-life balance where we can attract um, more people who want to live in a town and work in a town like that and spend their dollars here. I mean, and this and concept support of, our small businesses in doing so. Yeah, I think the concept of quality of life, I think, is, is something that is um, served us well and could continue to. Um, I'm going to move on to topic number three. Go ahead, last comment on it. This I could probably make it on any of these, but I just, I think there are a lot of interdependencies on all of these. So um, when I think about businesses, I also think about housing, for example, yeah. and affordability of housing. So I, there might be some overarching themes, and I will put one on the table, which is to increase diversity, inclusion in town, become a more welcoming town for different income levels, uh, different races, different ethnicities. Um, and I think as we think about businesses and housing and uh, community character and all of these things, maybe just think about those interdependencies and some of those overarching goals uh, that will make Simsbury a stronger community. Yeah. So I think you make a good point. There are many, many interdependencies in the plan. We tend to deal with these as topics because when the town is seeking guidance from the plan on a particular issue, having a sort of a kind of a go-to box is uh, part of the user-friendly uh, aspects of the plan that we search for. Um, we're not always successful, but I think we do try to recognize the interdependencies that, that go on. So topic number three is sustainability. So in the current POCD, we have a section on sustainability, but it's kind of buried because back in 2017 and the plan before that, really hadn't taken on the prominence that we see today in terms of this particular topic. So we're kind of wondering whether or not sustainability needs to kind of move up and, and take its place at the table with conservation, development, and infrastructure. As the gentleman just pointed out, sustainability is sort of interdependent with all of those things as well. But it's also an issue which is likely to grow in importance in the future. But first things first, why did people put their planning points in this box? What did, what did that box say to you? What, what, what called you to put points in the box? 
Come on, everybody. Put, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm, as you said, sustainability is actually in every one of those, of those items. So I'm actually very surprised that sustainability ranks as high as it did because open space is sustainability. Even on development, they can just not sustainable. So, um, so I'm sure of our sustainability community in town, and I'm very interested to know what people thought of when they put their money into sustainability. Um, I'll tell you what I was thinking of, and that is um, that we are facing climate crisis, and we want to leave our town for our children and grandchildren that is healthy and sustainable. And really what that entails to me is we need a much more efficient um, town. We need, uh, as, all, as new developments come in, we need to hold them to a very high standard of building performance. Um, we need to electrify at some point. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. And again, this document is aspirational. It's not gonna happen overnight. But we need to stop installing natural gas in town. Um, and the third sort of leg on that stool is renewables. Okay? So we want to promote, we want to have a, a, a discussion in town about where is solar appropriate and where isn't it. We want to have policies and I think uh, uh, permitting practices that are, that are friendly for that. We need to uh, we need to work with the state, meet the state's goal for meeting the sustainability goal. For me, a big part of sustainability is addressing the climate crisis. So I think what we've been thinking about is that the sustainability contains a couple of parts to it. So ecological sustainability deals with the issues of climate change and other things like that, environmental aspects, so there's that element to it. There's also economic sustainability, which is an interrelated thing to business and economic development we were talking about. As the gentleman also pointed out, in terms of housing, what's happened with housing, there's a social sustainability element that you know, people can't afford to live here. So this is part of the reason why I think sustainability might start to move up in the plan, or it's got to be reflected in all parts of the plan or something. So we're, we're trying to figure this out a little bit in terms of where we are today and what the community thinks for the future. I don't see anywhere there population growth, how that impacts our capacity for the schools and bringing more people here brings more shoppers to the local businesses to help support them. So planning for the school system is a key element and the school system itself does this every year to try to get a sense of how many students are coming in. Do we have room for them? We've gone through waves where, oh, we have too much capacity, let's close one of the schools to, oops, we don't have enough, let's put on an addition. And that's totally tied into the population growth, which ties into sustainability and economics, et cetera. But I, I don't see population growth issues anywhere. It's very hard for a town to control population no. growth. We don't. But grow, we put in, what, a thousand new units of apartments which I think put enough people back into the schools that were starting to decline in school population so and brought more people to shop locally, hopefully. So this is such an interesting topic. So it's something that um, I'm investigating as part of the plan. The reason I grew this chart here is what we find over time, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, the baby boom, right? yes. baby boomer, yeah. baby boom echo, <coughs> hi everybody. Yes. Um, but what we end up with is, uh, demographically, we end up with birth spikes and increases over time. And so what happens is there are times that births are increasing as a result of the parents of our baby boomers, the baby yes. boom echo. And so what happens five years later is school enrollments increase. And then we're sort of over the top of the hump and it comes down. So it's, it's hard to say, well, you know, we're, we're going to stop people at the border and say, are you, are you planning on driving through or are you going to stay here for what, what are you going to do? So we try to, to manage this to, again, enhance our own quality of life with the services, et cetera. So I think this issue about demographic changes with the number of housing units that were added, um, town planners have looked at the enrollments resulting from these units um, and smaller apartments and things generally do not generate the school enrollments that single-family houses do but I think that what you point is important for us to be thinking about is as part of the plan yes ma'am so I was actually here to be able to 
Go ahead and change it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I think of that more like the gentleman over there did, which has got to do with the climate crisis and all those extra people that might be coming here, but they have to drive to Hartford perhaps to work. So we generate them thousands of people that are on the road and using their cars and mm -hmm. electricity. I mean, so sustainability to me. And, and it's funny again I've lived in this century long enough I remember when electric heat was a bad word right, right? it's like don't do electric heat oh my god everything else is cheaper more efficient and everything else and yet here we are because of the impacts of fossil fuels and the other stuff it's actually situations that electric heat and geothermals and other stuff like that renewable energy sources could be our strategy for the future so you know the more things change the more they stay the same Yes, sir. Yeah, just a, a quick observation. I think there is an element that comes along with sustainability that the town needs to think about, which is what population you want. Development for development's sake is not necessary, but if you build it, they will come. And so in the 10 years from 2010 to 2020, the state of Connecticut grew by less than 1%. The town of Simsbury grew by just about 7%. We were attracting people the whole time. Is that what we want to do? Uh, and, and you've heard a lot about how we attracted them and the, the basis we, by which we did that, which was by some pretty high density development. Um, and that's there's a conscious effort that goes into planning for the population that you want and the infrastructure you want. So I'm, I'm with you, and you're the expert on the cycles, but there are also policies that the town puts in place that will help determine the size of that population growth. We do have some control. I, I agree, and I think people should should be aware in the room what a shock it was to Simsbury with Hartford Insurance Group after a building that had been up for sort of less, I don't know, more than 20 years. years, I guess, basically said, you know what, thank you, we're out of here. So they took down one of the five or 10 largest taxpayers in Simsbury, and the question is, you're worried about you know the reassessment that everybody received in the mail today but what are we going to do and part of the thought process for Simsbury at that time was to basically say you know what housing can be economic growth pay taxes not put kids in the school system so this could be a strategy that would buffer us from the impact of the Hartford so did we grow yes in units and population but also part of the thought process at the time was that the residents of those apartments could be the purchasers of your house when they're ready to sell. Right. So it wasn't haphazard. It was part of a cogent thought process to be <coughs> meeting the needs of the residents. Business and economic development for taxes was number two on our list. And so we have to find the right balance for all of these things. Um, and I, I think that was certainly a phase in history. This gentleman back here had your hand up. And was over here. Yep, go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to echo what Mark said about uh, sustainability. I, I really think that sustainability is more of a value than uh, necessarily one thing we got to spend all our points on. It can be a part of every single thing we plan for. It can be a part of affordable housing, uh, biking. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a college, a former college student who came back to Simsbury where I grew up. And one of the main reasons I did so was because of sustainability. Because you know, unlike other parts of this country, we, you know, we don't have a whole lot of litter on our streets. Our waterways are clear. Um, we've got clean air. We've got amazing bike trails. Um, and I really hope we continue to uh, practice that and uh, value that and preserve that as we move for the next 10 to 20 years. You be careful. We're going to appoint you to a local board or a commission. <laughs> was there, I think, was it your hand and then in the back? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, well, first of all, I want to say I actually know that gentleman. I kind of thought of what he said, but what he said it made a lot of sense, so I just want to say I agree with that. Thank you. Um, but what I was thinking is I just wanted to mention, um, with regard to sustainability, one of the things that I don't think anybody's mentioned yet is, um, you know, local food and local farms. Um, I think that that's something that, you know, we're, we're blessed to have some good farms in town. And um, I definitely would like to be able to focus on those, or at least support those so that we can continue in this day and age with supply chains and you know, all of that. It's nice to be able to say that you know where your food is coming from and that there's local, local growers. So. I tried to get Tolmetto to sponsor ice cream for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, my main point was exactly that same thing. It's, I think it's the 
sustainability really is community lifelines. So, you know, what are our real lifelines? It's our clean water, local food, local energy, local businesses, local sufficiency, really figure out how to in the community if things do get challenging with, well, everything. So that's what I consider sustainability. Thank you very much. I'm going to move on to uh, topic number four, which was housing, affordability, housing needs, housing issues in general. Um, why did people put planning points here? Yeah, I think affordability of housing is, is very critical. And number one, I'll say for diversity. We are not experiencing the vast reality of other U.S. citizens, and our children are not growing up in an environment that equips them or recognizes that there's an evolving equality. Since very, what, 30 years from now, will be a town almost totally occupied by minorities. The other positive part about affordable housing is for the people who built this community and their children. This little place was not a town. I mean, it was legally, but it was not a town, not a community of size until the 50s. It was after World War II. People came back. They could afford a modest housing. You see a lot of those houses around here still today. And it was affordable then. And as they aged, they could stay here. They could volunteer when they were not working anymore. Those people in some of those apartments are not young people. They are people who sold their house and they're aged and they feel like, okay, then I don't have these costs, I don't have the taxes. But look at the price at one of those apartments that's comparable to their house. It's not an economic advantage. So I believe, and what I mentioned before about open space, and I have been told by town officials, commissions, you cannot return an open space to a viable, sellable, residential market. But on almost all of these cul-de-sacs around town, if they got permission, they needed to have an amount of open space. So sitting behind a couple of these houses, not on their property, is what would make a back lot or an affordable house. And the thing that discourages me that we're not going in that direction, the Gerard property in the center of town originally was going to be modest, affordable housing. It's now going to be apartments where the price exceeds what the mortgage on a house would be. So, that's my Good point. It seems for those of us who've been in here longer than you, you <laughs> told you, uh, that uh, aging in place is more difficult because we're building with mansions and these god-awful apartment blocks. We don't all want to go live in the villages. We'd like to stay here and support the schools for our grandchildren. So it's amazing how much housing has changed over the years. Um, I've done some work with municipalities on this particular issue, and if we take a look at the ratio between median house price and median income, back in the 1960s, a one-earner household could afford a home and have money to spare. It was affordable. It was down in the range of two and a half times the median income was the median house price. And century might have been a little different. I'm talking about sort of uh, averages. But nowadays it's up to four and five, which is why people have to have two income households. Or you have to have gotten into the house, sold it for a profit to get equity to buy the next one. It's created this scenario where, where people who have lived here perhaps their whole lives are looking for places to live in the town that they love and adore. And the choices that they can really afford on fixed incomes and other stuff aren't as readily available. So housing used to be taken for granted in communities. Like, it'll take care of it. We'll just put some zoning regs in, it'll take care of itself. It's actually starting to get to the point that towns have to start thinking about 
what should we do or what could we do on this particular issue? So it's a, it's becoming a challenge that, that we're going to need to work on. Yes, sir. I'm, I just want to make the point again, this is an area where it makes sense to look outside the town at, you know, sort of the bigger trends that we're, that we live within, uh, both at the state level and then national level. And clearly affordability of housing is not unique to Simsbury. So maybe thinking together with uh, other towns and at the state level about how do we collectively think about increasing the availability of affordable housing, similar to, you know, sustainability and, and other issues that are larger than us. Yep. Well, so, well, we had an affordable housing partnership years ago in town, and the result was Eno Farms that was built in the north end as a cooperative. And then it's really basically rental. Um, but the way to achieve more affordable is either you have free land to build something on, no mortgage, uh, zero interest, loans, uh, somebody has to subsidize it. Mm -hmm. So the idea you had was excess land that are these fragmented uh, subdivision open spaces. Um, you can, well, we already have zoning for uh, accessory apartments, mm -hmm. but they can only be so big as a percentage of the overall house. So maybe it's too restricted. Uh, maybe those should be reviewed. In some places, they create what's called a granny flat in the backyard. Um, if you have a big enough yard, but then you need to have set back your requirements. I mean, there, I don't know if whatever, I think we just banded the head group. I don't know if there is such a. No, but I think Simdery created an affordable housing plan in the last year or two, so okay. there's growing awareness of this issue and strategies being put in place about how to address this, because I think that that's something that's probably going to need to happen in the future. But of all the apartments that were just built, none of those were required to be? And so one of the concepts that communities around the state are grappling with is the concept of what we call inclusionary zoning, which is requiring the provision of affordable units in these developments. So yes, we kind of missed that opportunity, but that's something to think about for the Define future. Define affordable. <laughs> talking about I'll mean, well, yeah, come and see, it, it takes long enough that I'd like to Well, it has to do with what percent of your okay, income you it. pay for housing. Uh, I got it. <laughs> so basically, just to pick up on what David said, it, it's housing that is restricted in its availability to people earning less than the median income. So in other words, they cannot compete at the market price in the market, so how do they get started? So the housing is limited to people of certain incomes, and the sale price or rental rate is limited. So nobody's getting rich off of it, but it's a place for people to live. People who work in local stores, serve you with Dunkin' Donuts, you know, Starbucks, all the other places in town um, that need workers, um, and we need them. Um, so it's an important issue for that issue. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, just to pick up a little bit on what my friend Ray said about affordable housing. I think um, affordable is the term that's somewhat misleading because people have some preconceived notions of what affordability looks like. Um, I think as a community, we should think about inclusivity and how we provide for people, say, with disabilities. All of those apartments are three stories with no elevators. So they all have tall ceilings and big staircases, and somebody with a mobility issue can't live there. And but we allow that. That's part of our zone. Three stories with no elevators. So now we have large apartment blocks that are inaccessible to people with disabilities, seniors with mobility issues, and a variety of other people. So I think of it more as making housing more available to everybody. That means young people coming back to town who are looking for a more affordable rental that you could do on a, on a first cost. Um, older people who would like to stay here in town but might need one story living. Something like the universal building standard, which would provide for people to have different types of housing that can be accessible to different types of people. And I think important for us to, to sort of broaden our, our vision of what affordability looks like to more of an inclusive vision. We have people, say adult children with intellectual disabilities, 
um, in Avon, Avon just built an apartment block that has supports for people with disabilities so that people who have an intellectual disability can live there independently and thrive in their community. We don't, we don't have anything like that. We have nine apartments that are vacant. That's, that's the extent of our availability to that type of housing. We have one low income housing area and that's the Centenary Housing Authority. Nobody even knows where it is, but <laughs> that, that it exists. But that's all we've got. And we need to do better than that. We need to do better for our seniors. We need to do better for our young people. And we need to do better for people who have certain challenges. <laughs> Uh, so the, the regulations of the state of Connecticut say that you have to put aside 10 percent of the housing for those who make a median income of 60 who make 60 percent of the median income so you make 60 percent of the mini medium income 10 percent of the housing should be set aside if that's the case where are we uh, I'm not quite sure. As soon as we reach percent, about four and a half percent of that metric. So, down in the scribes and state, 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 state law, which provides a developer the opportunity to not have to comply with local zoning regulations if they provide a certain number of affordable units, and that's where the 10 percent uh, number that the gentleman spoke about comes from. And since Sindhuri is about 4.5%, we're not a 10, so we are subject to the Act. So developers can come along and propose affordable housing in our community and not have to comply with our local zoning regulations. So there are different levels of affordability in there, but the issue is um, we lose the ability to guide this development the ways that we would like to see it. Um, and so there could be reasons for us to move ahead. So, all right. Going to move on, so go ahead. Okay. Just to address what you said, when that law is applied, the developers do not want to develop for 60% uh, of the median, median income. They're allowed to develop for 80 to 90% of median income. And at that level of pricing, we already have 25% of the stock that we sold that is sold on a normal basis without any deed restrictions at that level. The problem is the law allows developers a loophole to not really make the kind of affordable housing that Cheryl was talking about that we so desperately need. And is the income hey, move on, guys. Town base? We've got about seven yes, more topics we're trying to get to. We're not going to reach it. I think we got the sense that this is an issue which we're going to have to focus in on. Um, and so uh, we'll continue to work on this as part of the plan. Topic number five is community character. I think when we did this exercise six or seven years ago, I think character might have been number one on the list. So clearly some things have moved up on the list. Why do people put their planning points in community character? I think what Cheryl said about affordable housing is a lot to do with our character. So a little bit of a roundabout way to say it, but you know, I think inclusivity is something that we really have to work on. Uh, I think we got to look at modeling uh, towns like Avon with a one-story affordable and inclusive housing. Um, I, I also think that community character, town character, this is a term that's very often used to invoke uh, against affordable housing and other types of housing. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that. I think in a lot of instances, affordable housing is good for our community care. I think it helps us. I think it makes us stronger as a town when we're more diverse, and we're more inclusive of people of all income brackets, of all racial backgrounds, of all uh, abilities. And uh, I, I really hope that that's the kind of community care we're talking about over the next 10 to 20 years. So character often has a visual element to it, but you bring up excellent points that it's more than just how things look and feel. It's part of who we are as a community, and I think this is where the concepts of inclusivity and diversity start to tie into this as well. Other thoughts related to character that people would like to express here today? Well, I, I didn't vote for it. I didn't put community character because I think the open space, the sustainability, the uh, business development, 
it all sort of ties together. It's yep. not to me community character isn't a standalone. It's 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 not. part of the it's it's a, a chunk of it's a little bit of all of those. No, and I like I like the motion you're making because it's almost as was pointed out earlier the cross connections between these different topics that actually is, is what kind of makes our community special. I saw yes, ma'am. Uh, for me, when I'm thinking of community character, it's one of the reasons, um, big reasons that I have that I moved back since then. So we both worked at the Hartford, lived here, and left and moved across the river. sort of pointing out interconnectivity of things. I think character kind of goes through everything we were talking about as well. So we don't want business or economic <coughs> development that detracts from our community. So we'd like to figure out ways to have it enhanced. And the same thing, I think, with housing. So we're going to try to figure out ways to kind of blend uh, all of this moving forward. Number six on our list is community facilities. Why do people put planning points here? have enough, we have too many. No, go ahead. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Full disclosure, David Bush, chairman of Park and Rec. We have the gem of the, of the entire state of Connecticut at Cincinnati Park. Okay. And the key to any town facility is the continued care of that property. Uh, if any of you have been up there recently, you recently got private donations for a basketball court that is just second to none. We just got private donations for screening around the paddle tennis court, second to none. But the town, not private donations, needs to take care of this facility. There is every real estate agent in town will tell you the first place they take anybody, other than maybe our schools, is Sinsbury Farms. We have a beautiful facility up there. And so I just ask you as the Board of Finance meeting comes around, support the park and rec budget because why? I think you all find some way to use what we do. We're, the, we're down at the meadows, we're the walking trails, we're over on the open space. Please, the town, the message I would want to the to the town is, is we talk about facilities, yes, we have schools, whatever lane, 40 million. Um, but you know what? To spend 250 grand to build some pickleball courts, it's really valuable. Thank you very much. Chief takeaway from the meeting: pickleball. <laughs> Other thoughts? Yes. Yes. Um, I think council includes a lot more than I think people are realizing. Talking about accessibility to town hall, the town staff. We're talking about um, if there's issues with um, engineering or town roads and all of that stuff. I mean, that's what I consider that. I mean, I love the Great Farms. Don't get me wrong, I love it. Um, but I consider it's, it's everything to the town. Our senior center, our social services, everything that our all-inclusive town is going to need for services. So as we are planning for and desiring for things to have, we've got to have the the, um, the facilities in place, the people in place, everything in place. Our town library is beautiful. We have the facilities for, we have the staff, all of that stuff. And we have that in place. 
to include all these people to come in. And I think as part of your point is well taken because I think community services and facilities are incredibly diverse from public health, public safety, fire, police, ambulance, even though not all of these are town functions, they're important to our quality of life and the situations and circumstances that we encounter on a regular basis. So I think the town works very hard on trying to make sure that we've got adequate facilities and services to meet our needs and enhance our quality of life. And it's not inexpensive. So I, I think these are issues that Simsbury, I think, has demonstrated we excel at these types of things. And so continuing to work on these um, and pickleball courts are, are part of that. <laughs> Any other thoughts on community facilities? I have one. Yeah? I don't know if this comes out of the category, but those of us that have electric vehicles, would really appreciate if we could have a charging station. <laughs> So I think that's a growing issue, but I'm not sure fall. That may fall under the sustainability element of the plan, but I, I just think that um, a number of communities around the state have been struggling with this issue right now in terms of what's the right number of electric vehicle charging spaces to put in parking lots for the future. Because if we don't start now, well, much of the infrastructure has to go underground. So it needs advanced planning. And that's actually where plans come in. So that's an excellent point. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I would like to bring up the senior center. I, it, the, I run a charity group for the senior center. And we're all older women. The building. We are now sharing our room with the social work. So when we meet, she has to leave the room. We feel like we're in her living room. It's a beautiful room. But we're intruders now. And the fact that we're up on the second floor, there's no bathrooms up there. If someone has to use the restroom, they have to go downstairs. The elevator is very slow. The stairs are treacherous. This is not a good building for our seniors. When it came up before, it was, it was thought of as a senior center. I think this should be now as a community center for all ages. When you look at other towns and they have beautiful centers, we are a vibrant community and it is a shameful place to have our, our seniors. So if you're not aware, um, the senior center of that, you know, Memorial Hall um, has been there for quite some time. We're now in a demographic situation where baby boomers, etc., are moving into the age groups where these services might be useful, beneficial, attractive for people. So we've got a growing population and a facility that's serving multiple masters in terms of seniors and social services. And the building wasn't really built for the needs of today. People didn't live to be as old as they are today when Eno was built. So uh, it's come up on the radar screen uh, to introduce and talk about as part of the plan. The plan doesn't make things happen, but it identifies things that need to be put onto the wish list and, and work list for the future. Um, and I'm pretty sure that this will, will end up there. So. And it's the same with the parking. There, yes. We have handicapped people. There's not enough space. Yeah, so for people who don't know, behind the Eno, there's a ramp that leads into the building, which is a challenge. And it's, uh, there's a number of issues that are, that are there. There's no question about that. Um, the next issue is Simsbury Center. So why do people put planning points in Simsbury Center? Center right up there with open spaces defining the town physically. It's interesting as we think about town centers in Connecticut, Simsbury's town center is linear. A lot of the other town centers are not. They're a little bit more compact. So when you think about walkability in some other town centers, you could start in a place and almost go in any direction. And Simsbury it's a little bit different. So it's hard to get the critical mass of pedestrian activity that kind of holds it all together. But that's also why the charrette, which occurred, could have 
maybe not 10 years ago, but some, some maybe it was 10 years ago actually, was looking at the, the ways to sort of perhaps develop to the rear down towards Iron Horse that we could now get more activity and create a critical mass that starts to feed on itself. So these are issues that the town has been working on, but there are some challenges in this regard as well. Other thoughts on Simsbury Center? Yes, ma'am. I would say I agree, um, you know, as far as Simsbury Center just has a feel that really just says Simsbury. And I, I remember distinctly, which was years ago, I remember I in Vernon, rather, and so I never come to Simsbury before. I remember driving into town and being like, oh, this is where we're going to live. It's just beautiful. I mean, it's just got a look and feel that, that's very distinctive, and we want to preserve that. Thank you. I see something about Simsbury Center, we know business and property, so um, we need to be more attractive to visitors in the sense of telling people where things are. I mean, I have people asking where the flower bridge is, where the pack is, where everything is. We need to include more short stuff in order to direct them to where all the great things are in the Simsbury Center. Um, I don't have a big plan or a small plan. It's, I think, between the parking and, and everything else, we need to be able to direct them and direct new people where things are now and the activities going on. Yeah, it's funny you think back to when we did the sculptures, remember the sculptures yeah, all around town? Yeah. But people sort of were walking around with maps trying to figure out where things were or whatever, and there was, there was definite activity that happened with that. But if we could identify our amenities better, it might make us more attractive and more sticky. Yes, sir. Well, an example of that is the flower bridge, which a lot of people pick as a favorite place. What we do every year, well, not during the pandemic, but go around to the eating places in town, and we create a brochure with a map. This costs them nothing. We also solicit senior centers to come and see the Flower Bridge, and they get the map of restaurants, or they can get a box lunch from Fitzgerald's, I think. And I, I know we have a Main Street partnership but I think every organization that has some interest in the downtown, our center, can find a way to help support it. Well, we're very fortunate in Simsbury because we have the Chamber of Commerce, we've got the Main Street Partnership, um, we've got an Economic Development Commission that all sort of work in this area. So um, we've got the capacity, I think, to accomplish a lot of this stuff. Anything else on Simsbury Center? Uh, number eight is natural resources. I'll tell you what, let's do this. We're down to 20 minutes left. I'll, I'll hit you real quick. Somebody mentioned the river earlier. I got to speak the river. Um, to live on it, it is a treasure. Um, and the open space, when, when I think about natural resources, open space they're, they're all together um, it was said before but the open space protects the water and the water is just a it's a wonderful source of life of wildlife it's a it's a true way that can't be done. yeah so what I'm gonna do here with 20 minutes left in the meeting is open up all of the remaining topics so it's possible we might not have gotten to the last one on the list in terms of traffic and circulation, but there may be other issues that people want to talk about and are important. So we've got 20 minutes left in the meeting, so it's open. I'll be quick. I thought you were going like you're hungry and you needed a No, snack. this is like I will be short. Oh, I can, I'll, <laughs> No, I think this kind of a forum is wonderful. And I think the process that caused us to think and weigh and chew was great. I would suggest one more thing, is that if their mailer goes out from the Planning Commission, that it lists all these areas and we respond on we think the town is doing well or it could be improved or it's doing too much. So we actually did a town-wide uh, survey back yeah. in, in December for each of these areas. Right. No, it was a slightly different. Again, we try to sort of mix the message up a little bit each time to, again, try to get input from people. So the results of the survey, George, are on the town website, correct? They are. The survey results is posted. Yep, thank you very much. 
So you can take a look at that, and that's input again to the plan process here where we uh, try to reflect what we think we heard from people. So you can watch and see how the plan is going to come together based on what you've heard and seen here tonight and what happened as part of that survey as well. So there will be other opportunities later in the process for public input. Um, we're hoping to be adopted by the fall, but we expect to have a draft plan, I would think, probably by May or so. And so we look forward to your continued input, et cetera, as we, as we move along in that. Did you hear that? Yes, ma'am. I just wondered what the plan is to reach. Um, I'm going to make a wild guess here that most of the people in this room are over 50. <laughs> and I'm uh, wondering what the plan is to reach the younger members of the community, the kids who the parents are home tonight with their young children. Yep. Doing how, how do you plan to reach these portions of our town population? So we looked at the online survey results and we took the people who were sort of eligible to participate, which is ages 20 on up, and compared it to the census information. We thought we got pretty reasonable distribution for the community there across all age groups. I appreciate all of you being here because when we say you got to be in this place on this day at this time, it's kind of inflexible for people. But that's also why we ran the survey first, was to give people an opportunity to participate, and I could tell from the times that the survey, there were people up at two in the morning that, that gave us their input. And we still appreciate it because, again, everybody's part of Simsbury, but they're not always on the same schedule. So we're trying to include everybody, and certainly people with children or school children or whatever, uh, even a single parent or anything else, it's hard to get them out because there's a lot on their plate. Um, but if you can think of ways to keep people informed as to what's going on, we're getting great coverage, if you will, from the uh, local papers. So that's uh, nice to see, social media, et cetera. So um, we're hoping to keep awareness up and, and get input as we go through the process. Did you? Just a quick question. Was the survey somehow sent to people who work here but don't live here? Um, I think we asked people one of the first questions, do you live in Simsbury? And do you know about local sentence? Uh, there was very few that didn't yeah. live here. There were some people who did respond because they were either off at college, okay, and people who used to live in Simsbury still like our community and have fond memories and wanted to weigh in on that as well. But it wasn't enough to sway the results, and so all of those results were merged in uh, into the survey so report. Like teachers and employees at Meadows and, and business employees and stuff would not be represented. No, that we allowed people with I work in town, et cetera. So I'd have to go back and look at the exact breakdown. Um, but I think clearly we got stronger representation from people who live in town. And so, uh, but that information is, is available. Yes, sir. Getting back to the natural resources, it'd be nice to have better access to, to the Farmington River. Yes. I mean, no, we can't do anything like Collinsville does because of the way the river is. It's, we don't have a big giant pool. something with uh, steps. I know it's hard because double-edged sword, it's a, nat it's a, was a national resource or wildlife thing, so that now it involves the Army Corps of Engineers. Anytime you touch the river, the bank, you need their approval but you know, like down by the far bridge, steps or yeah. ramps or whatever, launch canoes. And so, I mean, it's possible to rent uh, canoes and other things like that on the river. The scary thing that we have here is if you miss Curtis Park, you're headed for Terrafield Gorge. So just that, that's the one element we sort of have to be careful of. But I do think river access, um, for many years, the river was sort of hidden behind trees and stuff. And think about the rail trail, what that opened up for our community in terms of the ability to travel through neighborhoods that you could never have seen from that perspective before. So we learn things in new ways. And I think if, if we can look at ways to enhance river access, um, Curtis Park works well. We really don't have anything functionally equivalent up on Nod Road up in that way of town. Um, we do have the sycamore tree, et cetera, these types of things. So there's possibilities, but, um, and there may be higher priorities in town, but um, something that certainly could be looked at. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. I, you mentioned a few things. I just want to emphasize that you just said uh, rail trails connected neighborhoods, and we're talking about the river. I'm thinking about the beautiful park by the Flower Bridge. And, you know, the the plan is to be thoughtful about uh, gathering spaces and ways of connecting areas of the community that might feel disconnected either through, you know, more access to rail trails. But I think even, um, I wasn't part of the charrette process 10 years ago, but it sounds like there was a lot of thought around 
how do you design downtown as truly a town center where people just don't buzz through but actually find gathering spaces and mm -hmm. you know bump into each other so to be thoughtful about you know the next 10-year plan in how Simsbury can continue to facilitate more participation and and um, conversation among community members uh, tonight's a good example of that yeah, and I think again the, the the plan of conservation and development is almost like me eating a meal once every 10 years, right? We get together, we have an intense thing, and then we sort of exist with the plan for town. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited to have a chance to work, first of all, with my hometown, but on a plan five years, that realistically a lot has changed. So if we hadn't, if we waited 10 years, we would be kind of wasting the next five. So we're going to get a chance to jump in on this. And, if we could do meetings like this on a more regular basis, just to make sure we're staying in tune, that'd be pretty awesome, I think. So, yes, ma'am. Regarding walkability and, and bikeability of town, I've been working on that issue for about 10 years. And I didn't choose it as top three, although it's very, very important. And the reason why I did is because it's very much embedded in, in many of the different um, categories that we've talked about. So when I think about walkability and likability, it's about our community character. It's about encouraging community health. It's about sustainability, getting people out of their cars. Um, you know, obviously, natural resources, open space is, is very much tied to the rail trail. So um, it, it's hard to, to choose it as a top three, but I think it's a very important aspect to many of the other categories. Thank you for mentioning that. This the fact that Simsbury has made quite a bit of progress in pedestrian accessibility and activity and also with our bicycle designations was uh, recognized in the, by the survey participants. Some people encouraging us to keep going, nice job. Some people had a more motorist, you know, like those darn bikers and all the other stuff. But I do think we've got a lot to be proud of here. I live on County Road, which is a fairly busy road. There's a bike path, and right from my office, I can, I can see the, the number of bikers that go by, and I'm just really tickled that as our community that, you know, we've managed to make this much progress. People are jealous of what we've been able to do here, and so, so that's good. And it supports business as well. It does, it does. Was there... Oh, in the back, I'm sorry, you're behind the cameraman. I couldn't see you. There you go. Yeah, something that occurred to me, especially if you don't have many younger families, So when you say turf, you're not meaning grass, so you're meaning... Artificial turf. Thank you. Oh, so one of the problems with recreation facilities is that as the population grows, many more kids participate in sports and activities today, and so as a result, we have to find spaces to put them. Um, and the challenge is, is the more intensively we use grass, it's harder to keep the grass alive, so it gets to be dirt, and that becomes a big problem, etc. So the issue becomes one of lights and turf, as, as ways to make effective use of the facilities we've got. So it's a, a difficult issue. It's not inexpensive, but also important. So thank you for, for bringing that one up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have two comments. So the one's about the document. So the document we were looking at was the document that was in the I'm, I'm not sure I was looking at it correctly, but you go through it, reading all the different sections, and just something red with a little box next to it. And I've, I've asked myself, some of it I know, we did do more stuff. But if somebody suggested we didn't do the part of improving access to the river and carrot. And I almost feel like the document, the online version, I know this is a little more work for somebody, it needs to be more alive. Mm -hmm. Like it needs to be able to tell me, who may not need it to every meeting, or maybe on vacation, what's going on and how far we've gotten. And it almost needs to be more of a living document that people can follow and check in on. And I understand that's more work. No, can no, I, no. Can I make a comment? Because as, as part of the planning commission, and certainly as chairman, um, and then we had conversations with George that we, we did, I was part of that, you know, that did the last one, 
well, if we put these action plans in, but then we have to go in and check back in, right? Because there wasn't, wait, and Glenn, and we've talked to Glenn about that, that that is absolutely one of my priorities, that if we're going to put it in, then, and that's why we want to meet with the zoning. We, we are meeting with conservation, like we want their input, because if we're going to hold people's feet to the fire, our feet to the fire, we want that buy-in, and then we're going to go back and say, we said we were going to do this, and, and have a way, we're going to make it a regular so we, we totally agree with you because well, the documents should be live and we should be holding ourselves accountable to so what's in there as much as we can. My other comment also related to the way everything is put in there and that there is sustainability and what's to my understanding. Sustainability almost goes in every section. Almost like we need to sort of rethink it because like our document looks, I know it's a template, but under counties, because I was looking at other counties. And it's kind of easy to do it that way. I just think it needs to sort of have a different feel to it. The next stage is the only part of it. So, part, so the question in a sense is, who are the users of the document? And so it's not written to be sort of the great American novel. <laughs> but I think the idea is, as a public policy document, we would like to be able to transfer information quickly and efficiently so that should there be a con conversation, let's say, with the Conservation Commission or somebody else, they can open it up, look at the table of contents, and sort of says, well, what I need to find or what I need to know is probably in this section, and they'd be right much of the time. So as a result, it's got a little bit of a utilitarian flavor to it, and that is part of the challenge. I have had the opportunity over the years to work with different plans with different formats, and also then go back 10 years later, and almost invariably the response has been, can we go back to the organization that we used to have? So I think I've written it down. I think it's something for us to think about. Because as Aaron said, what we want to try to do is make a, a user-friendly document that reflects where we are and where we're going. So I don't know if we have it nailed yet, but we're working on it. And I do think sustainability, part of the challenge is when you put it a little bit in each section, the big picture doesn't rise. Well, there can be a part that's about that. Yes. I just think, well, just the whole idea that people need to, every commission, every town needs to ask, what are we doing? And is there a sustainability part? I agree. Yes. You know, so that would be zoning, planning, design people, everybody. And even though the planning commission has the statutory authority right. to adopt the plan, we're trying to meet with other boards and commissions so that their thoughts or feelings and input are recommended. Um, so everybody feels like they're part of the plan. Because I think, as Aaron says, that's what we hope to help lead towards implementation. So that's that's part of our goal here. Our Machiavellian scheme or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> implementation of the plan. Yes. Well, this is in regards to walking and biking and it ties into the uh, community character. There are parts of the bike path that are just in total disrepair. And I think that is how it ties into community character because it really speaks to the lack of care that we are providing to our bike paths. So, which, can you give me a sense of which part of the bike path? Well, I typically walk behind in Hazel Metal. Yep. Between Mitchell's and yep. Route 10, and the fences are just totally falling down. Yeah. Got it. So that, that there's quite a bit of history behind that section of the trail or whatever. So it's a shared responsibility, perhaps. But I think I made a comment. So I, I thought you were talking about the trail surface, but I get your point. Yeah. Thank you very much. And it's also a danger aspect. There's fencing that is falling into second growth. So if a biker yeah. happens to have a mishap, they're going to be right down in the second yep. Other parts, other comments for the POCD? Yes. Um, so I just have a question. I don't know if anyone can share with me. I heard something about a survey and then a document. So I guess I didn't know about either. Where would where would I find that information? Or where, how so, would I know about the survey? Yeah, so I think. Um, so we tried to do traditional press releases. We put information on the town website. We use social media to try to get information out. I use Google Alerts a lot on my phone. I don't know if you ever tried those, but a Google Alert put in Simsbury, and every day you get just a little update about stories that are going on, what's going on in town, and things like that. So 
I mean, it's, it's funny. Years ago, it was like, you read the paper, right? <laughs> Farmers and Valley Herald, anybody? Right? If so, you subscribe to the town email, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So I think there are a lot of ways that we could could do that, and I think a part of our desire is for all of us to be connected, and we already are, but to be connected electronically. Yes, sir? So new to town, moved here for the schools, Welcome. safety, the community, and Simsbury's doing a lot, right? They're attracting people, and don't hear far off for us. Know what you're doing. Thank you very much. Yes, sir? Why not the boards and start it with yours? We are two business owners in town. We own buildings in the center of town. No one ever reaches out to us. Wendy does, Heather does, Amber does, but we've never seen you guys. You've never reached out to us in 30 years I've been in this town. No one ever makes the effort to become proactive and ask us, the people that own these buildings. Well, try to build these buildings with good tenants. I understand. Uh, yeah, but no one ever reaches out to us. And why, why is there, there's no proactive? Right, so, so let, let's back up for a second here. I mean, we've got the Chamber of Commerce. We've got the Main Street Partnership. Are, are you a member of the Chamber? Yes. Because okay. I think they're representing you very effectively in terms of issues related to this. Um, the Economic Development Pro uh, Commission has a program to go out and meet with business owners. I um, disagree with you. Well, they don't. I, I know people they have spoken with, so you're not. I'll, I'll, I'll pass that information on. Thank you. You need to become more proactive. I understand. It's a two way street, though, too, right? So I appreciate you being here today <coughs> to bring this to our attention so that we can redouble our efforts on that. So I don't want you to feel ignored or not appreciated because I think the town works hard in a lot of different regards, but I think that this type of relationship, they do interact with the Chamber, the Main Street Partnership, and others to try to, um, to work this, but maybe they need to be doing more in this area. So, thank you. Uh, you know, I, it's not very often I get to adjourn like 9 o'clock on the dot, but look at the clock, look what it says. Um, George, if you could do me a favor, or, or Joe, there's a uh, poster over here with the uh, post-it notes. If you put that up by the door. So guys, um, first of all, thank you everybody for your participation here tonight. The conversation, I, let me finish up, hang on. The conversation I just had with Joe is that there's a poster there by the door with post-it notes. So if there's something that you wanted to say, or even anonymously or whatever, Please write it on a post-it note. You can fold it up and stick it there on the board, if you will. And share us your thoughts or feelings. Please try to stay connected. If you've not given us your proud way to If you've not given us this, you can either put it in the box or give it to me. So on behalf of the town and the planning commission, I'm going to thank you, everybody.